following program is classified G. It's suitable for all ages. Good evening and welcome to our special presentation tonight and tonight we are going to talk about something very interesting and very adventurous I would say and on the show we have two very special adventurers who have basically traveled almost everywhere around the globe and with that I would like to invite Frenchman Dimitri Kiefer and also Latvian Kalis Bardelis to discuss about their adventures on the show today. So they will be focusing on the topic of circumnavigation, I would say. I know it's a big word, but for the people who don't know, Dimitri Kalis, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, it's where you travel from one point and travel about 40,000 kilometers in one direction and come to the same point again, am I right? Yeah, that's fairly correct. Uh you go around the world by using human power. The important word is human yeah. power because sometimes uh, you could go by sailing boat and that would be also a, a circumnavigation or circumnavigate the world by, by uh, a motorcycle. Uh, in, in our case, we are uh, starting in one point and then going around the world um, by using only human power and coming to the same place where we started, uh, which uh, in both of our routes were different. We, we, we took uh, different routes for, uh, I, I started in, in Africa, Dmitri started in the uh, US, but uh, yeah. All right, I would like to take both of your intakes on what made you all start this adventure, first of all, what inspired you to get into this navigation? Okay, I, I might start uh, with my story shortly. Uh, I've been into climbing uh, and mountaineering uh, mm -hmm. s since I was in my early 20s and uh, snowboarding and that type of adventures. And then um, uh, I understood uh, that uh, I, I get most of the life, uh, like the best, of, the best version of my life is happening when I'm on adventure. And uh, I've been reading a lot of uh, climbing books, uh, cli like uh, big climbers who climbed the eight, uh, 8,000 meter peaks. And since then, uh, I've been inspired to do these kind of things. And when I tried them for myself, I understood that that's the real juice the, where I can where I can live the, on the full, uh, full, full my potential. So. Yeah, I just love to be in the middle of adventure and then just started this, this project uh, six years ago and um, yeah, been continuing uh, stages, stage by stage and that was the first spark, the mountains actually, the vertical uh, challenges. Now it's more uh, horizontal challenges. So. In, uh, in my case, has been um, I started with a running background. I used to do long distance running, ultra marathon, which are um, anywhere uh, longer than marathon, but it could be 100 miles, 200 miles, and then it gets addictive when you want to say, oh, I can do longer than that. So you start doing long race of 300 kilometer, 500 kilometer in the desert in Africa, then in Alaska, and on my way, I met a man who. Um, Across the Bering Strait, and we, I was also doing adventure races for you, kayak, cycle, so all those races. But I was more what you call a weekend ad warrior. They go for the weekend, get all, do, get all your adrenaline, do all these races, and then go back to your normal job on the weekdays. And then I realized at one point I, I wanted to do, I, I had the freedom uh, to be able to take some longer time off to do this and I, I got more involved and I had kind of have a long bucket list of things I wanted to do and that's how I got involved in doing this in, in a longer distance. The other thing that I like a lot on my expedition is um, um, crossing the civilization and the cultures that I come across and I sometimes, that's why I also take a long time because I, I besides the, the, the physical challenge, I also like the, the notion of meeting different cultures, whether it is Shakshi in Far East Russia or, or Bed Bedouin in the desert in Africa. So I really enjoy the, the people that I've met and the, the culture that I've seen on my way. And that's been fascinating. 
And y'all have been traveling for so long and what were some of the key points that you learned from this adventure or some points that you thought that I'm going to remember this for the rest of my life? Are there any stories like that? Well, I think there are so many stories. Uh, we, couldn't, uh, we couldn't stop to tell you the stories. We could stay here for hours uh, to sharing our experiences, I think. Because, uh, uh, yeah, on a journey like this, there, it's... Um, if you want some particular story, uh, like for example, I've been rowing across the Pacific uh, for two years. Uh, I started in uh, Peru and uh, arrived in, in uh, Malaysia after two years. I stopped in several islands on my way and, uh, and it took a long time, uh, but uh, those experiences I will never forget uh, uh, meeting those local people on islands that 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 friendliness that openness uh, and of course some kind of uh, let's say extreme uh, encounters with the sharks or there was one uh, uh, fishing boat quite a huge ship of about like 80 meters long about 2200 tons in uh, total weight which came in a distance which we are sharing right now almost like I don't know one and a half meters or something like this in, in uh, they almost crashed crashed my boat it was really close call but uh, uh, definitely I'm re I will remember those funny moments I remember those extreme moments for the rest of my life definitely and definitely I have a plan to come back to those places where I've been uh, but the next time it would be with my future family uh, with the sailing boat so definitely coming back to Sri Lanka because I've made so good friends here Dimitri what about you? Um, I. Some of the landscapes sometimes are quite fascinating, quite quite breathtaking. Uh, in the desert, for example, or in, again, and I, again, I tend to like the more extreme uh, environment. So whether it is in the in the frigid Alaska, or in, the, in the Arctic, or in the desert, where, like one time I pulled a sled across a section of Russia in one month, I saw one tin can. I saw no one, no no signs of of, of life. So that was quite fascinating. Uh, it was a while being on land to be to be to be quite in the, in a, in a very uh, solitary experience uh, but at the same time also I, I very cherish the moment when I meet people that live in a very isolated place and they are it, very used to be able to fix anything very simply very quickly because that's the life it takes to live in this really remote area whether it is in an island in the Pacific as Carlos has done or in myself some people living in a in a minus 30 weather in Alaska. One story I would just share, I was, it took me one time, I was, I was in a very isolated village and I asked the man, what do you miss living here? And it was minus 45 degrees, which I know is very hard to comprehend for people in Sri Lanka. And I asked, what do you miss living here? And he said, ice cream. And I just, I just was really, <laughs> I was blown away because it, it, for some reason, most of, it, it, they can't really transport it. Or so, so I was just taken. I was just uh, so this type. Sometimes you you get response that you don't expect, and you're just just puzzled by the whole the whole matter. Uh, so again, so it's um, I um, yeah the culture and the people and uh, for, like I was saying earlier. So. Uh, those have been really intense experience for me. That's just amazing, you know, traveling around the world, meeting new people, different cultures, different sites. That's just amazing. And one thing I picked up on you, Carl, is you said you encountered with sharks. Uh, yeah. What did you do at that point? I, well, usually people being cut and, and want to ask about these uh, like extreme moments. Uh, I really had on both hands those really valuable, amazing moments, as Dimitri said, sometimes the scenery is so good. You know, there have been, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit away from your question, but sometimes, and I remember vividly uh, the moment when I saw uh, the land for the first time after 140 days since I left Peru, I saw land and I was that close that I saw trees, that was the French Polynesia. And I saw trees, and the, the 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 island was so green. My favorite color is green. And I saw for the first time this 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 island with these trees. 
And I really, for the first time in my life, I cried because of the beauty, like, of nature. And that was so deep, like, uh, I will definitely remember that for the rest of my life. Uh, the other thing about the sharks, well, yeah, uh, sharks and any kind of living creatures search for a meal uh, just after the sunrise and before the sunset. So they just want to have their meal. And uh, the sharks were curious, what kind of object is this? Because any floating object in the ocean, it, uh, sur uh, it's surrounded by kind of an ecosystem. Some smaller fish, then bigger fish, and, and then they come the bigger <laughs> fish. So at that time, I felt that I'm not on the top of the food chain. Uh, because, because those sharks, a uh, shark is hitting with the tail. It's not, well, they, they of course bite like this, but uh, first they want to kick their, their uh, uh, not obstacle, but um, target. Target, yeah. So they 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 try to kick the the boat with the tail, uh, and this uh, this force uh, is such enormous that uh, you know if, if it, I usually compare it if someone is uh, taking a brick in his hand and throwing with all his force uh, uh, to the wall and the sound would be the same as I had when I was in the boat and and I knew that oh, I have a six millimeters marine plywood uh, separating me <laughs> between me and those sharks it's quite um, quite uh, spicy <laughs> at the moment but you cannot do anything about it you I, I just continued to row out of this area but uh, yeah those sharks were curious they tried to I guess they tried to flip the boat or something but uh, um, you need you need to be calm in these kind of moments of course it's now it's easier for me to sit here and like uh, a guru says you need to be calm and this and that but at that moment you know my uh, my kind of uh, attention goes through the roof you know <laughs> I even say that uh, in my in my stress level scale, I got a new new measurement. <laughs> it, it was of about. Of course, you were surrounded by sharks. Yeah, so. it was it was about uh, average, <laughs> definitely. And uh, but yeah, I just rolled out of that area, and eventually they understood that this object is not going to be our dinner. To, to res if I may uh, compare from the shark story, in my case, the the, the most. Uh, the time when I was uh, uh, this, the most afraid of potential, potential death were always in the Arctic. And one of them was when I crossed the Bering Street with uh, Carl Bushby, a uh, British guy. We were pulling a sled and uh, first uh, we were afraid of polar bears because we, we saw them a few times and you see blocks of ice everywhere. So we knew that there are a lot more of them seeing us than we seeing them. But then at night when you're sleeping in your tent and the ice move is constantly in movement because you're in the middle of the sea, so the ice start cracking and makes incredible noise and you, you could be, uh, the ice could just open up and you could fall into your sleeping bag, into the, the water, which is pretty, pretty quick death. Uh, that becomes a lot more scarier than the polar bear. So it's all relative. Suddenly you don't care about bears, you're suddenly wanting every single little cracking noise, you become really, really uh, sensitive to it. So again, your, your fear level changes a lot in that regard. All right, after the, we have to go into a short commercial break, but we'll continue this discussion afterwards. Let's go into a short commercial break. You're watching the special presentation. We'll be back soon. Welcome back to the special presentation and we are in discussion with Dimitri and Carlis and in the first uh, half of the program I think we discussed about your adventurous stories and about your journey. Something I picked, another thing which I picked up was you like the colour green and you like trees and I would like to pose a question to Dimitri. What do you think of Sri Lanka as a tropical country because you've travelled so many countries around the globe. As a tropical country, what do you think about Sri Lanka? Um. I, I really enjoy the. It's 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 a, one thing that fascinated me in Sri Lanka was the tea plantation, and I've seen a lot of tea plantation in Kenya, Uganda, Burundi, and Tanzania and Malawi uh, through my crossing of Africa. 
but what was so special about the tea plantation in Sri Lanka is a mixture between the tea fields and these, these beautiful trees. Um, I first read that when, the, when you first start having tea plantation in Sri Lanka, you wipe out some of the jungle to have those tea plantations, but now you see a combination of both. So you see these, these trees from the, uh, that belongs more to a jungle in the mixture of those tree fields, of those uh, tea fields. And that's, that's beautiful. That was really stunning. Um, I took the train from, uh, my wife was visiting here with me, so together we had the opportunity while waiting for Kali's arrival. We took the train from here to uh, Abanar, Abanaraba, uh, near, to, near Sigiriya. And then from there we took it up to Kandy and Kandy to Ella. And of course, going into Ella is a beautiful train ride. One, one of the I think one of the best train rides in the world from what I heard. And it is really stunning. And the jungle you come across and the villages, it's, it's a beautiful part of the country. So the mountainous part of the country is beautiful. Um, I, uh, yeah, that, that part I really enjoyed. Mirisa, that whole area, I had the opportunity to go down. It's, uh, it's struggling because there's a lot of tourism there. It's a bit crowded, but the water is still beautiful. The beach is still beautiful. So, uh, but it's, it, there there's more of a management issue of dealing with all this so much construction and so many people coming down there. But, but yeah, the, most of the country I've seen, I've really quite enjoyed it. And, uh, and the people also are very uh, uh, inviting and the food has been great. So yes, yeah, beautiful country. One thing I might add, um, uh, the port where uh, Carly arrived, Gali, is also quite a, a fascinating uh, historical port. Uh, I quite like the, the, the fortification around it. And I was there on, uh, with my wife on, on um, Independence Day. So to see these hordes of family, uh, Sri Lankan family, walking around the fortification, celebrating together and on this day, on this celebration day, was, was quite nice. It was quite touching. So it was, uh, yeah, it was good. All right. Now, when talking about the circumnavigation, human-powered circumnavigation, there are some challenges that you face when entering into countries, the clearance, the documentations and all that. What were some of the main challenges you faced from other countries and how do you think Sri Lanka coped compared with the other countries? Yeah, I think we have both different, uh, different stories because, for example, Dmitri has traveled mostly on land on his expeditions, that is, crossing the land borders, which sometimes can be really uh, complicated to get permits. I've mostly traveled uh, by, by ocean, by sea, and um, then I can compare this experience, how it was, like, say, uh, across the Atlantic, then crossing the Pacific, I counted it was uh, 10 places where I stopped in, in islands and uh, then eventually in Malaysia. So uh, Peru, French Polynesia, Tuvalu, Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, uh, and a couple of places in, in Indonesia, and then Malaysia. Uh, so uh, with the rowing boat, the rowing boat is a bit different story. Uh, but it goes under the same rules as sailing boats. And then there are like uh, the sailing community who share their information and experiences around the world. We have our own like forums and uh, websites and those people really rely to that information and really uh, kind of, it's a big influence. If someone says, you know what, I was there, it was bad. Uh, the sailors would uh, would uh, believe to sailor uh, more than if some other person, let's say, uh, any from other kind uh, kind of subculture, saying this. So, for example, um, what I've experienced uh, before um, that, um, and when I arrived in Sri Lanka, I was of course uh welcomed really royally <laughs> i would say because dimitri was here uh already beforehand and started to uh make these networks and contacts and eventually uh we through his uh, his contacts we con connected with the uh, uh, export uh, development board uh, mr suresh and and uh other important uh, people here in sri lanka uh and they helped my process to be smooth and easy for me uh, but even with those uh, contacts uh, it, it, uh, let's say we we saw that the process is a, a bit rusty 
and I want to, you know, I want to be quite straightforward in this message because I know that some sailing, um, the sailing community has big interest in Sri Lanka. They see that the, they want to visit Sri Lanka. There is a big potential because some of the islands doesn't have this kind of potential what Sri Lanka has. The location is perfect because you are in between the Thailand, Indonesia and Malaysia from those countries. If someone wants to sail to Maldives, you are in a, such a nice location because it's something around like seven to eight days from there to here. And for sailors, it, it's so good to again stop somewhere to visit nice places. You have all this, uh, all this potential, but I see that you are not on the right now not on a good course to using this full potential and I see that can be improved the main important thing maybe in the beginning is not to develop the port is the, to develop and establish a pretty simple uh, checking in and checking out for the sailors because right now the system is uh, is used as the same for the commercial big tankers or uh, or cargo vessels and and the uh, local uh, rules are right now trying to be something in the middle but for the sailing boats it's uh, you know i'm sorry the term i would think is cumbersome well, it's, it should be it should be a lot simpler right it should now. it should be a lot simpler uh, and I've talked to, and had uh, kind of uh, uh, they are hoping that with this uh, visit uh, here uh, something will move and something will change. They are really hoping that because uh, they want to visit. There is big interest from the sailing community to visit Sri Lanka, but they are not coming here because of some of these um, bureaucracy obstacles that they are uh, getting here and to be honest as I said I will be really straightforward there isn't a good reputation for for the system right now uh, in Sri Lanka and that's why sailing boats are, are missing Sri Lanka and Sri Lankans are missing on the opportunities to develop their businesses here. Dimitri what do you think about what do you think Sri Lanka can do to improve this situation right now of tourism and especially uh, nautical tourism? Um, uh, like I, I might not be well, I'm the right one to answer for that question since I didn't arrive by boat. But uh, when you see the feedback of people saying one, of, one thing, for example, is the requirement to have an agent when you land with a sailor, sailboat, that's, there's no need for that. I myself, when I cross countries by land and I'm being told you need to have an escort, you need to have a guide, you, you want to avoid this because a lot of time you're wondering, especially if you're quite experienced, what do I gain out of this? What is the point? And, and sometimes it's not just the agent fee, it's because you are with an agent, then people think of you or as an escort or whatever, as, as a well, as a well, uh, as a, as, as a cash cow. And so therefore, they start charging you more and more left and right. Well, if you arrive just yourself with your bicycle or with your rowboat and say, here, I can do all my document, uh, there's not this vision, oh, this is a big expedition that can pay things left and right. So it, it, having an agent can be really detrimental for, for that matter. Now, myself, I arrived here uh, w uh, w to welcome uh, Carlis, and I arrived with an e-visa, and the process was w quite smooth, I must say. You have, uh, my wife and I applied for the e-visa, and this is a good process. So for plane tourists right now, it's, it's quite simple. Uh, the fact that you require to be uh, fully vaccinated to enter the country is completely uh, makes the most sense, and that allows a lot of people that were able to come right now and visit your country currently. You can see people that have a vaccine that is not always recognized in another part of the world, but is recognized in, in Sri Lanka and are able to come on the south side, and for example, so that's, uh, that's good. Uh, I would say myself also, um, what I've, when I've been going around the world on my own expedition, the time I had the most challenges were actually on water. When you cross, especially when you cross, when you go from one continent to the other, from uh, United States to uh, uh, Europe, to uh, Russia, from, um, from Iran going into uh, Oman, from going, so all those countries when you cross water, when I cross water by kayak, that's when I really struggle with permission. So, uh, uh, and I, I had this very recently in Malawi when I crossed the border by kayak. I was detained because they were really questioning why you're doing on a kayak crossing the water. So if they know there's a road, they 
people systematically want you to be on the road. They don't really want you to do something else. So that's often an issue. So water is not the easiest way to cross the border. Yeah, so, uh, so just to underline, once again, uh, I think uh, uh, there are so many sailors who want to visit Sri Lanka and uh, they might stay and prolong their stay here. If there is a smooth process for them to come in and go out, and they, even yesterday I, was, uh, I had an, a nice chat with a, a boat from Belgium, a sailors from Belgium, they said that there is uh, 17 boats right now in, in uh, Thailand, uh, in Phuket, who is going to go sail to Maldives and miss Sri Lanka because of these issues. And they said they are going, they were the only ones who came here. Uh, and unfortunately, it, it, I think uh, it's just that there is interest from the side of the sailors. They want to come here, they want to experience your country. Uh, and I really hope that this moment can be a change in, uh, in, uh, for the future, for the better future, uh, for the businesses here, for the people here, and, and uh, yeah, to improve the system just to make it smoother and, and uh, understand that those people are not poor, uh, that they, oh, they couldn't afford to pay an agent. No, they can afford to pay in your restaurants, in, uh, in some uh, touristic places, and use, I don't know, Basazir's wellness uh, centers, uh, diving spots, all of those things can flourish uh, in the future and I really hope that it's, it's going to change. Definitely. I think thank you so much for your responses and your experience that you shared with me and our audience today. I'm pretty sure there are definitely little, little tweaks that Sri Lanka must improve as well. And I'm pretty sure from this program, people will be able to hear this and act according to it. And unfortunately, this is all the time we have on the show. I would like to continue this discussion, but this is all the time we have. It was my pleasure to meeting you as well. And I wish you all the very best on your future adventures as well. I just hope that y'all don't come across any bears or sharks again but I can't promise you all that sure. <laughs> anyway Dimitri Kalis thank you very much for joining thank you very me much the show. Well. thank you very much for inviting me and that was our program today on the special presentation I'm Suzanne Shanali have a good night